Hello, everyone. Everyone awake? <laughs> the second session after lunch, yay. Okay, we'll make this really exciting. My name's Leith from Palmer's North Library. I'm going to be talking to you about the needs analysis that we uh, went through to get from our old digital library to our new heritage archive. Um, after that, Glenn is going to talk about um, the how and the why of the build and there'll be some interesting technical stuff and diagrams and things. And then Heather will um, excite you all with a death-defying live demonstration of the new site. Um, it's going to be great. OK. Um, so this is our trusty old Patake Parangi, uh, launched in 2008. I think that was a year after the iPhone came out. It was kind of almost pre-mobile, pre-cloud days. And it really shows. Um, it's not interoperable, not indexable. Search engines couldn't index it at all. Um, not linkable. It had session-based URLs. And it was not easily harvestable, as our friends from Digital New Zealand will know, and as Heather knows, because of all the unpublished content that was ending up being published on Digital New Zealand as a result. Um, it wasn't able to show content adequately at all. Uh, Multi-page items, panoramas, video, uh, just really looked horrible. So this is a beautiful panorama that you can see up there. That's what we could show. Um, Heather will show you what it looks like now on the new system. Um, so the content itself is very well digitized, very well described, good metadata, but it just wasn't being shown uh, very adequately on the old system. Um, as for sharing and reusing content, well, just don't go there. That just doesn't seem to have been a thing in 2008. Uh, it wasn't mobile friendly. This is kind of what it looked like. Um, and you really couldn't facilitate community content, um, the uploading or creation of content. Wasn't interactive, not very engaging, not very usable. And by usable, we mean not easy to use, not easy to learn how to use, and not easy to remember how to use it once you'd learned it the first time. Um, and so the new system that you'll see uh, when Glenn and, and Heather talk um, is really the, the kind of first year of development. It was launched in June. There are another two years of development to come. Um, so you're seeing this sort of basic version. Um, and we're currently ironing out some small things and adding more functionality. There's tons more exciting stuff to come. So the needs analysis uh, took us two years to complete. Now, you might think, well, that's inordinately slow. Well, we were waiting for funding, so we had two years. And so normally, when you're buying a new system or building a new uh, website or heritage repository, you might say, what systems are out there and what can they do for us? Which ones can we afford? Which ones shall we go for? And instead, we, we decided to do... Um, to ask a more important question, which is really, why are we doing this in the first place? What's the point of doing this? What impact do we want to have? How do we want to best serve our community? And so in the needs analysis, we did tons of things. One of them was analyzing the current usage to see what use um, users were making. We also mapped stakeholders. I don't know if you've ever done a stakeholder map that's quite an interesting thing to do. So the idea is you, you list all your stakeholders. We had hundreds of them. And then you group them, you plot them on this chart, depending on how much influence they have over your development and over the content that goes in it, and how much interest they have in the system itself, in its development, and in the content. And so some stakeholders, for example, politicians and senior managers, have a huge amount of influence but not that much interest in, they don't really love this thing in the way that you do. And some, um, maybe some of your content users or local historians maybe absolutely love what you do, but they don't have much influence over it. And then some, 
in our case, we found that our content creators really had no influence and they actually had no interest because the system didn't allow them to do anything. And then a lot of others ended up somewhere in the middle. Now where it gets really useful is if you pick one of your uh, stakeholder groups, you can decide where you want them to be in the future. And we decided that those content creators needed to move to there. And so that was just a useful tool that helped us in making decisions about what it was we wanted to achieve. Uh, we did surveys and focus groups. You can all read what the most important things were that they told us they wanted. But you'll see it's all about interaction. It's about active involvement and creating and curating content. And so we took that very seriously. We also spoke to GLAM experts. Perhaps some of you are here. You'll remember it was a very long interview. And again, it's about reusing content. That's the important thing. Having really simple ways to find and interact with content. And of course, effective tools for, for staff to manage the content. We also forced ourselves to make some tough choices. Um, in an ideal world, you would have a system that is both incredibly usable and very accurate. So for example, your search interface very easy to use, and delivers incredible accuracy of search results. We knew that only happens in the ideal world. In the real world, you have to choose because those two usually pull against each other. Same with simplicity and functionality. Do we want a simple and functional site? Forget it. You have to choose which way you're going to go. Same with collaboration and control, open access, and strict legal compliance. And so as a team, we kind of pitched it there, and we decided that what would serve our community best would be a usable, simple system that would allow lots of collaboration and open access. And so that, all of these processes we went through in the needs analysis enabled us to explain to potential vendors and developers what was really most important to us. And so we knew that we wanted it to be really fast, super fast. The experience should be instantaneous. We also wanted it to be incredibly reliable, a bit like those um, knee gaiters that you see there. It would never let you down and never break down on you and just always keep on working. It needed to be incredibly simple in its design. It should do a few things incredibly well, rather than have bucket loads of functionality that get in the way of each other and that perhaps interfere with each other. Um, it had to be mobile from the ground up. It had to be built with mobile in mind first, not something that's tacked on to the end of your desktop user experience. And it also needed to be interoperable and talk with lots of other systems. Um, and so that enabled us to refine uh, all of our expectations and explain to vendors and developers what it was that we wanted. Instead of sending them a list of pages and pages of functional requirements, which would just confuse matters. And so we had three excellent responses to our RFP. Um, we really could have gone with any of them, but we chose to take the riskiest of those options. And so we chose to build from scratch, but we went with a developer with the right values and vision and track record, and crucially, a developer who really understood what it was we wanted to achieve. And that was Glenn. And so Glenn is gonna tell you now about how and why he built it the way he did. Cool, thanks, Leith. So let's get on with the how and the why of uh, the actual build and implementation. And like CM Ross, how do we guarantee satisfaction? Firstly, um, it's good to see uh, what we had to work with when the RFP landed. Um, the RFP was great, and the core part of the RFP was a list of fairly well-described features and wish list items. And this allowed us to interpret the requirements and write a concise response to each one. 
And I can't stress enough how much a well-written RFP can benefit both the vendor and the clients. Um, it, also gets, it also allowed us to get a really good handle on whether we could, could or even wanted to build what the library wanted. Um, we felt this was key. We were going to spend a significant amount of time in responding to the RFP and a significant amount of time building the solution. And this platform was something we had been thinking about for a long time and we wanted to make sure there was a, a good fit. Um, and we kind of wanted to make sure we could build a long-term relationship with the library and we wanted to make sure that the values, um, that we had some shared values and our values were aligned. And, and just to be clear, it wasn't uh, all about us, but more how we could really add value to the, to the library's mission. So I think it's good to go over, we started thinking about, Leo, what, are, what are our philosophies as a, um, as sort of a company and, and what we do? Um, st our sort of philosophies were to start simple, minimal viable product, and I'll, I'll just get a slide on that in a second to dive into a little bit more. Um, you know, MVP means kind of de-scoping for quality, so leaving stuff out so you can build a few things really, really well. Um, what really lies behind the specs that have been uh, given to us. So that means starting with a clean, simple design, um, and that's hard to get right. It's easy to add a checkbox, it's really hard to take one away. Um, so we're starting simple and adding more later, um, you know, based on user feedback and, and what we thought we wanted to build in the future. And then we had some more sort of platform-based uh, concepts that we had been thinking about. At a core, it's just, a, it's, it's just an object store. Uh, it isn't a website. It's a platform to deliver services where needed. Um, and storage is not a limitation. It's 2016. Uh, we can scout to millions of records and terabytes of information. So a 300 megabyte TIFF file should not be a, an issue in this day and age. Um, and in this day and age, who wants to build a server, uh, who wants to own servers? So we built this um, for the cloud. Which brings us to our last point. Um, we're keen proponents of open data and open access. So cloud and proprietary software shouldn't mean vendor lock-in. Um, it should be about delivering great services, but still allowing the client to get access to their data whenever they like. And I just want to skip back to MVP for a moment, because I think it's quite misunderstood. Um, uh, around the traps, one says minimal viable product. Um, MVP is not taking a stab at doing everything and doing a poor job. That's kind of more like prototyping, which does have its place. But MVP means taking each part and doing a great job on a minimal set of requirements. So what's going to get us to the next stage in our learnings, yet still deliver a great user experience? So instead of going across the bottom here, we just take a thinner slice uh, of the really important stuff and try and do that well across that across all of, those, uh, all of those areas. So taking those, when we started to think about the RFP, um, it became clear that you could break this project down into three kind of areas. And this allowed us to silo features, control scope, and work on different parts at different times. So the way we built this is uh, the object store handles uploads and processing of assets. It's a search server, it's an image server, an API and it can be accessed via REST or, or GraphQL. On top of that sits the collections online kind of website or the, the, um, the, the main sort of, the main website and the most visible part of the platform. And lastly, we encapsulated community as all the features handle interactions with the platform, things like comments, favorites, sets and articles, uh, and in the future things like transcription and, and geotagging. And Here's a bit more of a, a, a technical slide. So it kind of looks like this. So it isn't a website. It's a cloud-based object store with an API layer on top that provides access. Now, it's a bit hard to see, um, but every object is simply a text file uh, of metadata and the source, um, the source image. So the API is the smart that sits on top of that to deliver the content in a coherent way. Um, but if everything went Pete Tong, then you only had backups then if you only had backups of that object store, you could re rebuild the archive. Um, the front end is currently driven through WordPress, although we've just started redeveloping this natively. We found in the project that was probably the, one of the most least successful parts of um, the project to date. Uh, right, it gets harvested um, to Digital New Zealand, um, and uh, as one of the issues before was the session-based URLs, we've now got seven and a half out of eight and a half thousand uh, pages in the Google index. Um, 
It does cloud-to-cloud backup to Backblaze B2. So we've got the main store, we've got a Backblaze B2, um, and it can also be backed up by Palmerston North Libraries. Uh, Palmerston North has access to this object store where they can read all of that data and back it up into their own sort of corporate IT systems. Um, so we're starting to build in a little bit of that digital preservation uh, kind of stuff into it as well. In terms of performance, uh, you're just running it the other day against Google's uh, tools. We get 99 out of 100 uh, mobile rating. Um, so again, that increases your, um, your Google uh, indexing and, and Google rankings. Um, 70 out of 100 for the speed test. Not 100%, but we can, uh, we can get a bit better on that. And we're using HTTP2 and, and SSL. So again, that stuff that makes the website faster and gets stuff well indexed by Google. Um, and lastly, kind of what's it built on? Uh, it's really simple, actually. It's a Ruby on Rails application with Elasticsearch. Um, it's for the technical folks. Uh, it's the main website. It's built in React, and it's built on Amazon Web Services. Uh, and the image hosting, not just yet, but will be soon, will be um, AAAF kind of uh, image serving. So uh, that'll allow a whole bunch of uh, really interesting things that we can do with the images. So that's the kind of the how and the why we built, and now it's time for the live demo of death. <laughs> Just bear with me while I get all set up. Oh, that was easier than I thought. Oh. I told you it wasn't up there. Let's see. This is the trouble with a live demo. We have people muttering in the background. I'm sure it'll be fixed too. There we go. <clears throat> oh, so have to look at that screen. oh, all right. Okay, that's exactly what they told me not to do before. That's fine. Okay. Anyone know any jokes? <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much. OK, so my name is Heather Glasgow. I'm a heritage assistant at the Palmerston North uh, City Archives. And I'm here to tell you about how Mono2 Heritage has helped us to offer a better user experience for our community. And I'm going to be focusing on those issues that uh, Leith specified before in his overview of Pataka Iparangi. One thing I'm not going to talk about today is platform design. As I click around, now you can see it on the screen. Hopefully, you'll be able to decide for yourselves whether we have that right mix of functionality and simplicity. Um, it is a really fun platform to use, and I hope you all take the opportunity to explore it for yourselves. So the first thing that Mount Heritage does is it allows us to use our master images. Palmerston North Libraries has an extensive digitization program, and we have thousands of uh, high-quality, beautifully digitized images that before just sat on our internal servers and weren't available to the public. Uh, Mono2 Heritage enables us to share them exactly the way they were intended, and all images can be zoomed in on to reveal all details, like this one here. So you can see how quickly and easily you're getting all of the information in any particular image. Now, people love this feature. The availability of the high-res images helps with identifying people um, in groups, so something like this. And uh, as Richard Foy said before, he was very excited when he found his grandmother in that archives photograph. It's the same thing in our community. People come in, they find um, 
family members in photographs that they didn't know existed. So it's really exciting for members of the public. It's also great for finding those little details in images uh, that you might not have noticed before, which of course involves finding any and all cats in the photographs. <laughs> but also, I think this is a really interesting image because before zooming in, you might not have noticed that these gentlemen, they clearly work on the dying end of this. This is a flax photograph, and you can see their black hands. So it just gives a little bit of clarity about um, what those gentlemen did in their day-to-day -day life. Um, even we're finding new information in the collection, like in this photograph here. Um, we had this one labeled as uh, an old woman, but as a matter of fact, when you zoom in, she is in fact painted up to look like an old woman. <laughs> Unfortunately, Manawatu Heritage isn't CSI. If you zoom in on a low quality image, it won't make it more clear. But um, if you do have high resolution images, Manawatu Heritage is a great way to share them. So um, it's fantastic for all those regular sized images, but as Leith mentioned before, we have a lot of large format items which are completely unusable. Using Manawatu Heritage, we're able to share them just as they were intended. The original of this panorama is about a meter long, so making it 800 pixels wide really uh, diminishes its quality. Um, archives are about more than just photographs. Um, we have a variety of complex objects. Um, including videos, photograph albums, books, postcards, and more, all of which are available right on um, this platform. I'm going to use a photograph album to display a complex object for you. This one is a 1917 flax album. So you can flip through it, just like you're holding it in your hand, very quickly and easily. And you're also getting that deep zoom that we had with the individual images as well. So you can see the quality of your images is really important when it comes to Manawatu heritage. It's something that we never would have shared in the past because all we could put up were low quality PDFs. Now we can share them um, just the way that they are in real life. The next improvement is that all of the content from the simplest image to complex objects can be viewed on any device. Now we had a mobile emulator, but we're gonna try this instead. So you can see, hopefully you'll be able to see that the content shifts around the screen based on whatever size you're looking at. So from videos to the front page, searching, everything works just the way you would expect. And it uh, looks great on both large and small screens. It's an important um, matter to consider because a lot of our views come from social media shares. And so you're clicking back on your phone, but you're still able to use the entire website. Now, Manawatu Heritage also gives us much greater flexibility when it comes to um, making things available for access. About 85% of the content we have on the site is available for um, download, either under a Creative Commons license or under no known copyright. This is a, um, an example of one. And by hitting original, you'll download the original uh, master size file. And large is, uh, as you can imagine, a smaller but still usable copy. Now. Um, we do have donors who want to donate content to us, who want to place restrictions on them, and we can cater for that as well. But what's great is that um, you're still getting the deep zoom function, just like you were with the um, more open access copies, but you, when it comes to downloading them, you're not able to do that. Okay. Uh, the fifth and last final feature I'd like to point out is the community upload feature. So we really wanted to give people the ability to upload directly to the repository because we know so much of um, the important history of Palmerston North is in the community. So we've given the options to either upload um, single images at the moment or also to write an article, which is usually a story, which you can either populate with images that you upload or directly from the um, repository, images we already have. Now I'll just see if I can quickly show you what, what, what that might look like. This is an example of an article that's made from all three kinds of um, object. This is an image that was already on the site. We have some text and also some images that were taken specifically for this article. So it's a really visually appealing way of displaying lots of different kinds of information. Once an image is uploaded to the repository, it is displayed alongside everything else just as soon as it's been moderated. We also offer favoriting, tagging, commenting, and sharing, all those normal um, ways of engagement that you would expect. So what you're seeing here represents just one uh, year of development. We have thousands more records to upload, and we are also looking to expand functionality based on both uh, usage and feedback. It's been years in the making, but 
we're hugely proud of how Mono 2 Heritage has evolved, and the feedback from our community has been extremely positive. With the same content, we're able to connect and engage much more effectively because we took the leap and the risk of reimagining what a community archives could be. I think on behalf of Glenn and Leith, I'd like to thank you for being such a great audience today. And uh, thank you. Have we stunned you into silence? All the way over here. Uh, so you mentioned IIIF for the image uh, store, since that's kind of a standard. Uh, w w this is a bit nerdy, sorry. Um, what what, uh, what backend server did you go with? It, it, yeah, we're, we're going to be switching out to, to IIIF. It's not yeah. something we've got. We're, that's our next bit. We're going to switch out what we've got to, to that IIIF. Have still you... deciding on which one. Still deciding, OK. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. But I, I can see, but IIIF I've just seen is just getting a, a ton of um, a, a ton more interest in the glam sector in, in generally. And I just think it's the just seems like the right way to go uh, now. It just gives you everything in a box essentially. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Sorry, can you just wait till you get the microphone because it's being recorded <laughs> and I need the questions. Thanks. Uh, when the community uploader is being used, where does the content live until it's been moderated and added to the live site? Uh, it still lives with everything else, but it's just, uh, it's just in a process of being unmoderated, so the admins okay. can see it, but not the public. Okay, but it's already kind of on the server, the servers you've, you're using? Yep. Okay. <laughs> Someone right at the back, too. <laughs> Hi. Um, I was just curious as to whether you had all the high-res imagery before you started this project, or it was a trans you know, part of the transformation of prepping all this content into high-res. Uh, no, that was really um, the main thing, is that we had all of these thousands of high-quality master files, but no way to display them. Now, we did have a, a four-step process that involved emailing and forms and... Um, things that people could get access to them. Um, but in order to make them available, we had to, we had to start from scratch with a new platform. But the content was already there. Yeah. Um, it's interesting hearing this, having just seen the um, um, presentation for Dunedin Public Libraries. Uh, in the discussions that you had in terms of you know, looking for a system and where you were going to go, was much consideration given to something like Recollect or, or another platform before going out to design something, well, not quite in-house, but you know, something within the organisation? Yes, absolutely. I can't give any um, detailed comments about the RFP process because a lot was commercial in confidence. But yes, we had um, three vendors uh, and developers um, one was an open source um, product, which was Islandora, that was, uh, would have been supported by um, a local um, development company. And the other was, uh, was Recollect, and then Glenn's was the third one. So um, we were surprised at how few options there are for the glam sector to choose from, like really shocked at how limited it was. Once you knew what you wanted, to try and find vendors that could do everything you wanted. But um, yeah, so Recollect was definitely there, one of the options we looked at seriously. OK, supplementary question. Um, is this a product which um, can be sold? Sure is. Come and see me upstairs later. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, we, built this as a, we built this as a platform to, to roll out to others. Um, you know, the more people get on the platform, the better it gets. <laughs>